me have the choir come up, please. Everyone help us sing tonight. Welcome to the service tonight. If you will, stand please and turn your hymn book to number 147. Let's sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
Amen. Well, we can be seated tonight. We want to welcome everyone back to Tri-State Baptist Temple. We're just, we've had a good week so far in God's house at our annual Bible conference, and we appreciate the good Bible preaching we've had, uh, the good music that we've had, and uh, we just anticipate uh, more good things from the Word of God this week, and we're excited about that. Continue to be praying for our meeting. Uh, we're uh, to Wednesday now, but we still have three tonight, tomorrow, and the next night worth of preaching. We want to keep praying uh, about that and praying that the Lord will continue to prepare our hearts for his word and that uh, we wouldn't just be hearers of it, but we would be doers of it as well. And so we want to uh, continue to pray for this meeting, continue to be inviting people to come out and uh, enjoy the good Bible preaching and then come out on Friday for the choir as they'll be here. And so we want to encourage you to be uh, mindful of all those things. Uh, again, the choir will be here on Friday, and we want to feed them a dinner uh, before the service, and we passed a sheet around uh, on Sunday, and we're going to pass that around again tonight just in case uh, you haven't seen the list and you'd like to help out in some way. There's also a note that if you just prefer to give money, for it says for fruit trays or veggie trays that you can do so. You can do that for any item if you just like to put some money in instead of uh, going and getting the item, and then uh, we can go into Sam's and get those things uh, and so that'll be helpful as well. So if you just want to give money, you can see Miss Judy or Miss Angie, and they'll help you with that. Um, also, we want to just let you know that we're planning on uh, feeding them at 5 o'clock on Friday. And so we want to make sure that we have everything ready by 5 o'clock. We'll need people to help uh, with that as well, be here uh, preparing everything and those kind of things. And so just be mindful of all those things. And if you can help us out in any way, it would be a great blessing to us and to the choir as well. And so just keep remembering all those things. Uh, well, tonight, right now, excuse me, we're going to take our normal tithes and offerings of faith promise, and so we'll ask our men to come right now, and we'll do that. At the end of the service again tonight, we'll take another love offering for Dr. Geiler, but this offering is just for our normal tithes offering of faith promise, and so let's pray. appreciate that. Well, before our preaching tonight, our Lively Stones Youth Choir is going to come uh, again tonight and sing for us, so we're just going to ask them to come right now.
my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. Push away from the table, look out through the window pane, just beyond the children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my The church as we know it, it's losing its fire. Some are discouraged from bearing the load, but we must determine to keep pressing on for it. Just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every struggle, it would be worth every And singers go sing, and laymen keep telling that Jesus is King. The angels in heaven are surrounding the throne, and they'll start rejoicing for just one more soul. For if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every struggle, it would be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues. Was burdened down with sin, no happiness was found within, never knew the meaning of joy down in my soul. Then at last I finally knelt, contentment filled my soul like I never felt. Heaven came down, there was glory all around when he saved my soul. I remember the day when the Lord saved me. All of heaven came down, I was happy and free, for he filled my soul, for I knew the Lord had made me whole. I shall never forget the day when the Lord saved me. Now life of peacefulness, deep within my heart abides, since the day Jesus 
took my sins away. Now to heaven I will go. Spend the endless ages while they ever roll. Praising his name for the glorious day when he saved my soul. I remember the day when the Lord saved me. All of heaven came down. All of heaven came down. I was happy and free. I was happy and free. Glory filled my soul. appreciate those young people as they sing do a tremendous job and again just a blessing tonight and it's a joy to see you thank you for coming out and being here on Wednesday and we're here at our midway point of our Bible conference and we've just heard some great preaching all throughout the week and uh, you know it's just been good every night and uh, we just keep always anticipating Friday being a great night with the choir but every evening has yeah. been good and uh, so we're thankful for the Word of God and thankful the Lord has blessed Dr. Goddard, gave him strength and uh, allowed him to come be with us. And uh, we're just praying the Lord will continue to use him and uh, then give the uh, choir safety and help them to get down here all right and be ready to go in the services on Friday night. And uh, if you're planning on helping uh, with the meal and the things that are going on on Friday, uh, we'd like to have that ready for them to eat at 5 o'clock. At five o'clock is when they'd like to be able to ready, ready to sit down and eat. That'll give them time to eat a good meal and digest that thing a little bit before Brother Laner tunes them up and gets them ready. And uh, then they'll be ready to go in the services at seven. So uh, that's what time we need to be prepared on our end. And I know that uh, we'll be able to do that. Always appreciate all the uh, folks who help with the uh, preparation of the meal on Fridays. I do want you just to pray about a few things and. Uh, we've got a couple folks in the hospital right now. Uh, Keith Simmons' son, Caleb, is in the hospital at Belfont Hospital. He has a uh, touch of pneumonia, some type of uh, pediatric-type pneumonia, and uh, he's in there, and I want you to pray for him. And uh, it's a tough situation when you have a young child like that in the hospital. Just remember him, and he's been ill for a while. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, you just kind of keep thinking, well, it's just what everybody else has got going around, you know. And then finally, you just can't get over it. So uh, they took him to the hospital and uh, wound up putting him in there. So you remember him uh, in prayer. And then uh, Chuck Bridges, Chuck and Gene, his family that normally come. Uh, Chuck's been uh, in, uh, well, he went in, they took him to the ER last night. Uh, this morning he was still, he, he went to the ER at about 11 o'clock last night. At, at uh, 10 o'clock this morning he's still in the ER because they don't have a bed. Not a bed, nowhere. Can't get him in a bed. And uh, they need to get him in a room, want to keep him. And uh, he's having some difficulties and problems. And uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck has had, uh, Chuck was uh, in the service and uh, he is suffering from some type of uh, a brain uh, uh, trauma that comes through being involved where there's heavy shelling and uh, tank type syndrome type of thing and he suffers from that it's causing him a lot of difficulty in his in his mind and brain recovering from that different things that he's got problems with lots of different medications. They feel like he has pneumonia and the combination of that plus the medications have just got him, got him all out of sorts. So we want you to pray for him. Remember him in prayer. And uh, then Miss Phyllis uh, just was mentioning Elaine. And uh, we want you to pray for her. I'm gonna ask our church folks to pray for 
uh, Ms. Phyllis said they put her back in the hospital this week, and her body's rejecting that, that kidney there, and uh, they've got her in there for the next 10 days on really intensive medication to s try to stop that rejection process. And uh, so these are critical days, and we want to be people of prayer. I want everybody to pray for her faithfully. Pray for her every day. Just lift her up in the, you know, to the Lord. Get up in the morning before you put your feet on the floor. Pray for her, and uh, just remember her in prayer. And It's in the hands of the Lord, and he'll do a great work. But we want to be people of prayer and, and just lift her up uh, to the Lord. And uh, it's been a long time to get where she's at right now, and the Lord can bring her through this thing in a good way, but we just want to remember, uh, remember her in prayer for sure. And uh, then on Friday night, don't forget, we do want to take up an offering for the choir, just for the school. It's going to go to the school uh, just to be a blessing to them. And, uh, you know, they got to feed those kids uh, every day. And... Uh, they, uh, you know, the fuel that it takes to get down here and back and different things. And uh, we just want to try to be an encouragement to them and be a blessing to them. I appreciate their school. They operate by faith and trust God for everything that they have and all the means and things there for to, uh, to provide for the students and to take care of everything. And uh, we want to be a part of that. And uh, it's a tremendous investment. I appreciate the young people tonight singing about uh, what a great thing it is to see a soul saved. And, you know, there's no value we can place on that. And uh, I just pray the Lord to help me really get a hold of that. You know, we really believe that there's no cost too high for a soul to be saved. And uh, we want to invest in souls, and we want to invest in that school. And so uh, we'll be doing that on Friday and just pray and ask the Lord what he'd have you to do. But it's been an honor all week long to have Dr. Geiler here, and we're thankful for him. And uh, he's been doing a great job, Lord's using him. And uh, I'm just going to ask him to come, just bring the message for us tonight. He uh, has been up to Marietta last night and there this today and back in this evening. And uh, so we want to pray for him. And uh, Dr. Geiler, you just preach for us. And when you're done, you quit. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for letting me get away last night kind of quickly. I was able to be home at 11 o'clock and ready for bed at 11 o'clock and uh, got a good night's sleep, got up this morning. My wife, who is my nurse, <laughs> took care of my situation, and then I went and taught for an hour and a half. All of the students in the school are in my class, and I taught them this morning and then uh, did some work and left to come down here at good time. I got about 30 miles away from home and forgot uh, a case with things in it <laughs> that's essential to my well-being. I pulled over and I called my wife and I said, I forgot that case. And if I come back and get it and come back here and go on, it'll take twice as long as if you'll bring it to me. So she said, I will hurry. It took her about a half an hour. She came with it. And I got it and started down the road and I was way late. And uh, I... I drove comfortably over the limit. <laughs> what I mean by that is the state patrol allow you a certain, a little bit over the limit. And uh, I drove that through Athens to Jackson and then came down 93. There are more slow drivers on 93. <laughs> And there's only two places to pass between Oak Hill and, and uh, Ironton. There's only two places that the line's not double yellow. And I was behind every slow driver there was, and I was just panicking. I've only been late in 58 years to two services. One, I ran out of gas, and second, they gave me wrong directions. But I thought I was going to be late tonight. But I came tearing down the road. 
I broke the speed limit in Pedro. <laughs> but nobody noticed they had all gone to bed. <laughs> Students are looking forward to coming. We got 21 churches this spring to go to. Last count I had. Brother Laner takes care of that. We get in some of the most unusual churches. Yeah. I was preaching at Crossroads Baptist in Huntington for Brother Mays, and John Smith at Taze Valley was having the convention of the uh, uh, prison workers. What is that, Rock of Ages? Big crowd. That church was packed and running over. And uh, our choir, someone, probably Tim James, got it there to sing. <laughs> and uh, we had a boy from Northern Ireland, and he came from a staid, quiet Presbyterian church. Nobody ever said amen. And hardly ever did anybody cough. Very quiet church. After I preached at Crossroads, I went down to Taze Valley to come home with them. And uh, they were singing, and those prison workers had gotten excited, and John Smith had gotten excited. And the head of the Rock of Ages got excited, and they were running all over the church, waving flags, shouting. Every that boy from Northern Ireland came running out there and met me and said, "Don't go in there. They're having a church fight. You could get killed in that." <laughs> he had no idea what they were doing. We were in High Point, North Carolina, and got in a church. There's no churches like churches in North Carolina. We call them Happy Baptists. But uh, the choir was singing, and there was about 12 men there that just was shouting all the time, just shouting about everything, just shouting all the time, and running around and everything. Well, we had a break, and everything quieted down, and it got real quiet, and Mr. Laner, after the break, got up, and it was quiet, and he said, now we're going to sing a song about heaven, one of those fellows said, and everybody heard him, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> he, he meant they were really going to go after that one, <laughs> but... Uh, a lot of unusual things happen, but your church is quite normal. They will, everything will be okay here. I'm a little bit tired, a little bit unnerved from my driving. I'm, this is not a sermon. And, and don't go out and say preached, because I'm not preaching tonight. This is straight down the alley teaching. You know, when we talk about getting saved, we tell our neighbors, we tell our friends, we give testimony to the fact that we found out we were lost and learned that Jesus died for us through the preaching of the gospel and that he paid for our sins and we accepted him as our Savior by faith and by the grace of God, we were saved through faith. And Jesus saved us. Jesus wrote our name down in the book of life, and he gave us the righteousness imputed to go to heaven. We talk about that side of salvation more than we do the fact that when we get saved, he not only forgives our past, and saves us, but he gives us a new life. And we don't talk a lot about that new life. And tonight's message is seven 
new things that you got when you were saved. Seven new things. Would you turn to Ephesians chapter 4? Seven new things that every man and woman, boy and girl got when they got saved. I will point them out to you. You can underline them, circle them, whatever you care to do. But I'll point them out. Verse 23 is number one thing that happened. Something new we got when we accepted Christ. And be renewed in the spirit, verse 23, of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Number one, when you accepted Christ and got saved, you got a new mind. A new mind. A mind is what you think with, and therefore, after you got saved, there was new thinking. A new mind. New thinking. The book of Ephesians says, Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We get a new mind. What is that mind? It's the mind of Christ. We start thinking like Christ. There's four chapters in the book of Philippians where it says, let this mind be in you that's also in Christ Jesus. The first one is all about the gospel. So a new mind is a mind that thinks about the gospel, how to get it out, how to get it to someone, how to send a missionary with the gospel. It's a gospel mind. It was a mind of humility. He humbled himself. When a person has the mind of Christ, they have a humble mind. It was a mind that was uh, progressive. He says in the book of Ephesians, pressing forward toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. It's a forward-thinking mind. It's a moving mind. It's a going forward. And the last chapter in Philippians is about contentment. The mind of Christ is a contented mind. We get a new mind. Boy, my thinking was messed up when I got saved. I'd been told, if you'd be good, you'd go to heaven. I tried to be good. I really did try to be good. Only remember taking the name of the Lord's Lord in vain once. I tried never to steal anything. I tried not to lie. I tried to be good. I had a mind that if I'd be good, I could go to heaven. And I didn't know how much good you had to do. And I didn't know how good you had to be. And it left me frustrated, disturbed, and at unrest. But when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I got a new mind. I started thinking differently. I started thinking about the fact that I'm not working my way to heaven. Jesus did it for me. Jesus paid for my sins. I am secure in Christ. He has paid for it. Now, I just want to go out and serve him because I love him. Not to get to heaven, but just serve him because I love him. I had a new mind, new thinking. Anybody gets saved thinks differently. That boy that was hitchhiking and those college boys of ours picked him up and talked to him. And then he came to church. Then he got saved. Then we baptized him. But he had uh, the law hanging over his head. And he had to go back to jail. But when he did, he took his Bible. I visited him every week and talked to him and read the Bible to him and taught him. 
And now he's over there in Nelsonville, and his, he got a new mind. He's not thinking about getting a hold of a bottle. He's not thinking about going out and drinking tonight. He's got a Bible study going. And he has other prisoners come. He doesn't know much, but he teaches them what he knows. He's got a new mind, and he said, Preacher, I can't wait to come out and take classes at Marietta Bible College. I want to serve the Lord the rest of my life. He's got a new mind. He's thinking differently. New mind. We got a renewed mind. That happens to everybody that gets saved. They start thinking differently. And the more they grow and study the Word of God and go to a good church like this and hear messages like your pastor preaches, it renews your thinking. You become more new in your thinking. You get a new mind. Second, that you put on the new man. You not only get a new mind, you get a new man. When you get saved, you get a new man. Did you ever run into anybody that just greatly affected your life? When I was a boy about 14 years old, there was a man up the road drilled oil wells. He liked me for some reason. He would take me with him to go buy pipe. First time I ever stayed in a motel, he took me down to Charleston, West Virginia, buying pipe to put down in a well. And we stayed down there in a motel. I never knew what French fries were. He took me to a restaurant one night and they had French fries and what they were. My mother never made French fries. Made mashed potatoes or boiled potatoes or something. And, and after we didn't eat them all, the next day we had the potato cakes. Those are good too. And uh, that man influenced me. He wasn't saved. He influenced me in the wrong way. I became a Christian. I went to a meeting in Scotland, and I met a big man there. His name was Ian Paisley. He was a member of Parliament and a member of the European Community and had a church in Belfast, and was head of a denomination of 60 churches in Northern Ireland, England, and a sprinkling of churches around the world. Paisley took a liking to me. He flew me across the water 35 times to preach at his church. Paisley had been reading Christian books since he was six years old. I never read a Christian book until I was 20 years old. He was way ahead of me on the Bible. And he would talk to me about preaching and preachers. He knew the history of every preacher, every great preacher that ever was. He'd talk to me about those preachers and about prayer and about Bible study and things. He greatly influenced my life. He's lying tonight near the point of death. I wish I could see him because he, he influenced me. And you have met people that influenced you. And you young people, be careful who you meet because the two greatest things that will ever affect your life are the books you read and the people you know. And, uh, but no matter what, who the preacher is, no matter the missionary, no matter the Sunday school teacher, no matter the neighbor or a relative or who you meet in life that influences you, nobody affects you like meeting Christ. He's the new man in verse 24. A new man that comes into our life to influence us. Why? When I got saved March the 14th, 1954, I met a new man. He came into my life. Christ in us. The hope of glory, Paul said. He now liveth in me. 
I was walking the streets of Columbus, unhappy, empty, no reality in my life, 19 years old, not knowing where I'm going, not in trouble, not on dope, not into alcohol, not in trouble with the law, just empty. Life, no meaning. Walking down the street, going to a movie. And a boy that was handicapped mentally came out on the street, said, come in here and hear the gospel. Uh, no, going to a movie. Come in and hear the gospel. I don't know why, but I went in. 600 people in there in an old theater building, floor sloped. I sat down, about a third of the way down. Big tall preacher come out there carrying a Bible. That was different. I went to church 19 years and preachers never referred to the Bible. He preached the Bible. It was like he was preaching right at me. Christ died for you. His death was a triumphant death. It wasn't a tragedy. He voluntarily died for you. It was a victory for you. Will you accept him? Five minutes after nine o'clock, I did. Went home, never read the Bible. Fell across the bed and read the Bible till two o'clock in the morning. I started going down there at that church every service. I'd go down there through the day and just sit there because I liked the place so well because I got saved there. I'd just go in and sit. Nobody there. Just go in and sit. Dr. Heil said that he was preaching one Sunday night in Hammond, Indiana at his church. He looked back and there was a man off the street. And he... he one of the ushers brought him in. He sat down. He listened to the gospel. And he came forward and he got saved. And Dr. Heil said he had to counsel a dozen people or so in his office after the Sunday evening service. He counseled them, left. He came out. Nobody there. Everybody's going home except that man. And he was sitting there. And Brother Howell said, we're going to shut down now. He said, don't make me leave. Don't make me leave. He said, I heard the singing here tonight like I never heard. I was treated kindly tonight like never before. I heard a message tonight about Jesus I never knew. Don't make me leave. I want to stay here. You see, he'd found a new man, Christ. Well, I got saved in March, and between then and May, I'd met a new man. He started giving me the desire to preach. I never had that before. Nobody in my family ever were, were preachers. Nobody on my mother's side, nobody on my father's side were ever preachers. I told the young people, there was David and all his brothers. Well, there they were, great big, tall, little, and God picked David. You know, God usually takes one out of a family. Sometimes two or three or four, but most generally one. And I said to you young people from Papua New Guinea and Africa, look at you. Look at your relatives back in Africa. Look at your relatives in Papua New Guinea. Look at your relatives in the Philippines. And here you are in America studying the Word of God to be a minister. God's been good to you. God's been good to 
pick you up out of your family, your circumstances, and call you and give you high calling to serve Him and the opportunity to train. And hear all these preachers in America that come to prayer conference and to hear the men come that speak in chapel. Hear these American preachers that know the Word of God. Go to these churches and meet people and see how churches in America function. Oh, your choice. God has chosen you out of your family and given you this privilege. What a blessing. God picked me up out of a family. Nobody ever been a preacher. When I told my dad I was going to be a preacher, he said, you're losing your mind. But I thank God he reached down and called me. I've been preaching 58 years. You say, what would you do if you had your life to live over? Oh, I'd like to do the same thing again. I wouldn't want to be anything but a preacher. And I thank God he ever let me preach. And I want to preach some more. I, don't, I want to preach. I told the Lord I wanted to live to be 75. But when it came 75, I told him I was just kidding. <laughs> now, let's get back to our lesson. You're distracting me. Number one, seven new things you get when you get saved. One, you get a new mind. Two, you get a new man. That's Christ. Three, you get a new membership. Verse 25, wherefore putting away lying, speaking to every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of we are members one of another. I was trying to think what I was a member of when I got saved. I think I was a member of the union where I worked. I think I was a member of the Republican Party. I was a member of the uh, Methodist Church. I was a member of uh, my graduating class. I was a member of all those things. But when I became a Christian, I got a new membership Amen. with the brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. And on the local level, I became a member of the congregation in Marietta. We have a new membership of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are members. We are members one of another. How can I, a stranger, come down here to this church and maybe I could name a half a dozen of you. Maybe I know your last name from the years I've come here before. How can I come in here and feel such a warmth and a part of this church, and love you people Why? because we are members one of another. And when that choir comes here Friday night, the time they get through singing, you'll feel like you're members with them. There's three girls in there from Papua New Guinea. I'm not so sure but what they didn't slip up to heaven and get glorified and come back down. They're just the nearest thing to angels I ever saw. If they've got anything bad about them, I've never seen it. They'll do anything you tell them. They'll, do any, they'll volunteer to do anything that needs to be done. They never complain. We got a girl that will stand right there and sing who was raised on a garbage heap. Her dad and mother and brothers and sisters cement blocks stacked up and tin over them and they slept in there on the floor and when they got up there was nothing to eat and there was a place where they dumped the garbage it's called Garbage Mountain and that girl went out there every morning and looked for something to eat and she grew up eating garbage never slept in a bed 
Arvin Tablet went over there and found her and led her to Christ. Raked up the money and sent her to Marietta. She'll be here Friday night. She's raised on garbage. She loves apples. She never had an apple in her life until she came to America. She loves them. Every time I go away, I come back and give her an apple. Oh, she loves apples. She's so thankful for everything. Oh, she is so thankful. You'll see her here. Boy, if you get to know her, you'll be of the member with her. We are members one of another. We are members one of another. I'm not a member of this church, but I'm a member of you people. And you are members with me. Hallelujah. Now, what we got? We got three things. I'm not preaching, I'm teaching. We got a new mind. We got a new man. Verse 25, we got a new membership. Verse 26 and 27, we got a new master. Be ye angry and sin not, lest the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Got a new master. When Paul was at Caesarea and they brought him in before the king to give his testimony, after preaching to him, he said, O king, I'm not disobedient to the vision that I was to go to the Gentiles, to deliver them from darkness to life, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. The apostle Paul, and his name was Saul, had a master, it was the devil. The devil didn't tell him to get drunk, and the devil didn't tell him to, kill, to steal anything. He didn't tell him to be immoral with a woman, but he told him to kill Christians, stop Christ. And Satan had him wound up like a 10-day clock, looking everywhere he could to find Christians to kill him. When he got saved, he was on the road to Damascus to find people and punish them for identifying with Jesus Christ. But on that road to Damascus, he found a new master. He was delivered from the kingdom of darkness, where his king was the devil, to the kingdom of light, where the king is Jesus. Everybody in South Point tonight is under one or the other king. The devil's their king or Jesus is their king. Well, I'm just a neutral do-good in between. No, you're not. There's no middle ground. You're either under the power of the devil or under the power of Christ. You say, what do you mean they're under the power of the devil? Are they down on the floor foaming? And No. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded their minds, lest they, the glorious light of the gospel of Christ should shine into them. Everybody in South Point that's not saved is under the power of the devil because they're blind. They're blind. And you tell them how to get saved, they're blind. A woman went to our church and said, my husband's a doctor, graduate of Ohio State University. Will you come talk to him? I went over to a big house on the, across the river in Williamstown. There he sat. I talked just this, 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 this a while, and then I said, can I tell you how to be saved? Sure. I said, you are a sinner. The wages of sin is death, but Christ died for you and paid for your death with his death, and if you accept Christ, you're saved. Well, I don't understand that. I don't understand why anybody would die for me. I don't understand why anybody would want to die for me. Well, I don't understand why somebody had to die for me to go to heaven. He blinded a bat. He couldn't see a thing. And he's got all kinds of degrees from Ohio State University. But he can't see ABC. I started over. I said, ABC. You're a sinner. The way you sin is death. Jesus died for you, took your death. If you accept Jesus, you'll be saved. That's ABC. 
Well, I don't see that. I understand that. Talked a little while. He didn't see it. I left. His wife came out of the house, kind of walked halfway to the car with me. She said, what's wrong with my husband? I said, he's not all there. She said, what do you mean? He's a highly intelligent man. I said, no, he's not all there. He doesn't have spiritual light. He has no concept of God. What are we going to do? I said, pray for him. Pray for him. That God will open his eyes. He got the wrong master, and the master's got him blinded. Now, if the devil's got a hold of somebody, it doesn't mean he's got them down in the gutter tonight, rolling around in their vomit. He doesn't mean he's got them in a house of prostitution. When the devil is the master of a man, he just blinds his eyes. He can sit in church and not know a thing about being saved because he's blinded. He's under the power of the devil. From darkness to light, Paul said. Okay, i got to hurry here because there's a lot of new things, aren't there? This isn't a sermon. We're just studying tonight. Number one, what do we get new? We get a new mind. We get a new man. We get a new membership. We get a new master. And come on down. Uh, verse 28. We get a new method of living, new method. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good that we may, he may have to give to him that needeth. It's a new manner of life. Those people, those Ephesians, those Gentile idol worshipers, why, it was nothing to them to steal. They didn't have a moral code. Do not steal. They steal anything they got their hands on. They live stealing. Paul knew that. So when they got saved, they said, we got a new method of life. Don't steal anymore. Stop stealing. Labor, get a job, work, work with your hands, do that which is good, that you may have to give to him that needeth. You have to work, that you have to give to him that's in need. We live in such a selfish day. I work. And what I get is mine, and I'm going to spend it on myself. We got a new method. We work, we earn, and then we help missionaries. And we help the local church, and we help the ministry. That's a new method of life. So we got a new mind, a new man, a new membership, a new master, and a new method. And we got a new ministry. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Don't sit around, stand around talking about dirty things, corrupt communication. That which is good. That which edifies. That it may minister grace to the hearers. Do you know everybody we come in contact with? We're to minister grace to them. Yeah. You know, some, some people just want to talk about something dirty. If they can get you cornered, they want to tell you something dirty. And snare all about it and laugh about it. Paul, that's not the... Don't let that kind of communication come out of your mouth. But that which is good, that edifies, builds up, builds up people. That it may minister grace to the hearers. That's a new ministry we all have. 
to minister grace. Everybody you meet, you're going to influence them. When they walk away from you, they've been influenced. Something serious to think about. Came to church tonight, you met somebody, you talked to them. When they go home tonight and you go home, you influence them in some direction. You may minister grace unto the hearers. Got a new mind, new man, new membership, a new master, a new method, a new ministry, and new manners. Verse 32, new manners. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Be kind. If somebody stumbles and falls, be kind. Somebody in trouble, be kind. Be kind. The thing that won Mitch to the Christ, that alcoholic young man, walking the road, those college boys were kind to him. They took him back to school. One boy gave him his shirt. They gave him a bed to sleep in. They were kind to him. He accepted Christ. He was baptized. He's holding a Bible study at Nelsonville tonight. And he gets out in April and he's coming to school. He's kind. Those boys were kind to him. He wrote me a letter and said, I don't have any socks, T-shirt. Do I have any underwear? So I went to Athens, stopped on the way to Athens at Walmart and bought it for him, took it over there. Well, they let me in, met in a room. There you are, Mitch, new socks. Not one member of his family's ever been to visit him. Not one friend that drank with him has ever been to visit him. Nobody has visited him except the boys from our school. Why? Be kind one to another. Tender-hearted. There a fellow moved into our area, and he wasn't a very good preacher, and he's not too well-trained, and he's not refined and everything, and some of the fellows were putting him down and not having anything to do with him. I invited him to the school to speak in chapel. Oh, it lifted him up. He came. He preached. That's about the biggest thing he ever did. Speak to those students. Preacher said, why'd you do that? Because he's on our team. Why kick people that's on our team? If I'm going to kick somebody, I'll kick a Jehovah Witness <laughs> or a Mormon. They're not on our team. I'm not going to kick a fellow that's on our team. I played basketball. Good night. You don't go over and slug the fellow that's on your team. You slug the opponent. He's on our team. Next time you see a Christian having all kinds of problems down, remember, they're on our team if they're saved. Help them. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Well, there they are. New things. They all start with M. Mind. New mind, new man. New membership, new master, new method, new ministry. And new manners. That's good. Not because I taught it, because it's a word of God. Aren't you glad that not only did he forgive our sins, 
and impute righteousness to us, but he gave us a new life, a new life in Christ. Lord, bless your word. Take this fumbling speaking tonight. Take your word. Do a work in hearts. We'll give you the glory. In Christ's name, amen. Preacher. Amen. It's a great message tonight and great truth from God's Word. And uh, we're thankful that God has uh, blessed us with all those new things. And, uh, you know, we want to be we want to be actively growing uh, into those things, don't we? We want these things. We want to look at our life and just see how our life reflects those things. And well, I tell you, there's some things there. I need to just pray and seek the Lord. Lord, help these things just to be uh, visible in my life as a child of God. And uh, so we're thankful for a great message, a good message. Maybe, though, somebody here tonight has come to church, but they've never, never, never been saved. Could be tonight that you're here, and just like Dr. Geiler preached, you've just been blinded. You've been blinded. You can't see tonight that Jesus Christ died for you. And that you must be saved. You know, the Bible said we must be saved in Acts chapter 4. And uh, we all must be saved. Maybe you've never seen that before. And maybe tonight the light of truth is shining into your heart. And tonight you know I need to, I need to, I need to know more about this. I need somebody to take the light of the gospel and share it with me. And help me to come out of the darkness into the light. We want to invite you tonight to come. We'd love to take God's word and show you from the Bible who Jesus Christ is for you. If you know the Lord is your Savior tonight, why don't you just pray through and look to the Lord over those seven new things that ought to be a part of our life and ask the Lord to help you. Uh, let's stand together tonight. Find a hymn book. Turn to hymn 282 in your hymn book. And let's sing through a verse of that this evening. This invitation is for, for all of us. As the Lord has spoken, we want to be obedient to Him. Let's just sing that first verse together. If you need to come, come. We'll meet you here. Whatever the need is in your life, let's be obedient. Let's sing that first verse. <clears throat> Second verse, verse number two. <clears throat> seated for just a moment and it is such a joy to see you here tonight thank you for coming and uh, we want to invite you back tomorrow night our men are coming we're going to receive just a special little love offering here at the end for Dr. Geiler and we want to be a blessing to him throughout the whole week and you know the Bible says that a uh, man of God ought to be taken care of and want to be an encouragement to him and uh, uh, we're thankful for him uh, he's worthy of his hire isn't he and uh, we want to encourage him and uh, we're going to just receive an offering. But we hope you'll be back tomorrow night. I hope you'll come and bring somebody with you and tell them about the good preaching. Go tomorrow and tell them those seven new things that happened to you when you got saved. You don't think anybody would be interested in that. I think everybody would be interested in hearing that. A lost person would want to know, what in the world? Seven things. You know, people are looking for something new, aren't they? They want to know what is it about being saved. You know, so many times we can tell them about getting saved, but like Dr. Geiler preached, we need to know what it's like on the other side of that, of that new life that he's given us, because that's what people are looking for. They're looking for something different what they have. And uh, you can tell them. Tell them about those seven new things. 
and invite them to come to church tomorrow night. And uh, I know they'll enjoy it. But we're going to pray, and then we'll receive our offering. Father, thank you again for blessing the Word of God to our hearts. Help us, Lord, just to be your messengers, and Lord, just take forth what we've heard and share it. Thank you, Father, for uh, this offering tonight. And Lord, we pray you'll bless it and just make it an encouragement to your preacher. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> forget to pray about the folks we mentioned and those who are in the hospital and Miss Elaine, just pray for us, be faithful to pray and just believe the Lord and uh, uh, we'll be praying about the remaining part of the week just every night now, It'll be important and uh, great opportunities for us, but uh, let's go ahead and stand we're going to be dismissed and uh, just want to encourage one another as you leave and tell somebody how great it is to see them tonight and, and uh, just look forward to tomorrow evening, but uh, we'll go ahead and res just uh, have a word of prayer as we finish up here this evening. And it's been a good, good place to, to be here tonight. But uh, Brother uh, Randy Lane, just dismiss us in prayer.